Okay. Uh, <clears throat> the idea that Charles Bukowski, while living amid, amid the L.A. art scene, was not much influenced by it in his visual work may seem strange, but that is my thesis. I will argue that he was more influenced by Europe, European avant-garde painting. Most of the biography and testimony about him emphasizes his drinking, fights, and sexual escapades. But we can see his prodigious production of drawings and art in his books, articles, and letters. And we've been too long accustomed to dismissing this as part of the scribbles of a dirty old man. Now, here's the odd thing. Bukowski's work does not reflect the art that prevailed in California in his day. That art was dominated by two schools, the figurative and photorealist, typified by Ed Rusha and Wayne Thiebaud, and the abstract expressionist, typified by Richard Diebenkorn. We see Ed Rusha and Wayne Thiebaud up here on the screen right now. Both schools came chiefly from San Francisco. As Rusha said of LA, the 50s and 60s were a very drowsy time there. It wasn't just a matter of piling paint on a canvas as much as just living the life out here in LA. The movies were out here, the beach, the freeways, the desert. It had an accelerated pace to it. It was a fast city but it didn't have the cultural depth that New York had, or even of San Francisco. The contrast with Northern California artist Richard Diebenkorn, shown here, whose abstracted landscapes and flattened perspectives might have appealed to Bukowski, never appears as an influence. It's worth noting, however, that Diebenkorn admired Matisse and often shows his influence, as in the painting on the right. Diebenkorn also worked sometimes in line art. Most of his depictions of women were of seated, passive subjects. But there is a simplicity and lack of action here that didn't appeal to Bukowski. Bukowski was growing up in this pop culture of Los Angeles, the tabloid art of the LA Free Press and Open City, the Watts Towers, shown up here on the left, and more outrageously, and I think little known or appreciated in Europe, uh, the work of uh, Judy Chicago, Ed Rusha, and Ed Keinholz. Keinholz responded to the oddities of automotive LA's dream nightmare in his infamous backseat Dodge 38 installation. You see it there on the right, uh, featuring a couple making out in a wrecked vintage sedan, beer bottles strewn about them in a vaguely apocalyptic fugue of sex and hard metal. Rusha also famously photographed with a deadpan gaze, this is the title, 34 parking lots, 26 gas stations, and every building on the Sunset Strip, end quote, and title, published in a 1966 photo book that offered a movie-like road trip. But none of these people seem to have influenced Bukowski. We don't know what he read at the LA Library, but we do know that he hung out there. He wrote his first stories and poems there. Bukowski's attitudes towards art were influenced by a girlfriend called Barbara, in notes of a dirty old man, who convinced him to go to art classes with her. According to Buk, he was asked to paint a bowl of flowers, but rushed through that so he could go outside for coffee and a cigarette. When he returned, he found the instructor gushing over his hasty work and wanting more for an art show. He hated the class. One assignment was to create a Christmas ad for Texaco, the oil company. Bukowski worked the Texaco star into the shape of a Christmas tree, but the instructor humiliated him in front of the class. According to Bukowski, the design was actually used the following Christmas. It could be a myth 
But Bukowski said in this class, the instructor said, I want you to draw like Mondrian. And Bukowski responded, I want to draw like a sparrow eaten by a cat. My thesis is that Bukowski's art is equally, if not more, influenced by European sources. However, these influences pass through four Bukowski filters. They are simplified. They always prize the outsider. Their mode is antithesis. And perhaps most importantly, when using color, they are gestural. But in black and white, they are in the genre called line art. In Bukowski, in LA, Bukowski also met the poet artist Harold Norse, shown here on the left, who may have influenced him. And this is uh, Bukowski's drawing of Harold Norse. Norse had earlier, while living at the Beat Hotel in Paris with Ginsburg, painted very explosive abstract expressionist pieces, such as on the left here. And Bukowski did draw Norse. This is his a little cartoon uh, of him on the right. Curiously, Henry Miller, whose art, mostly watercolors, was also being produced in Northern California, uh, was a, an artist that Bukowski knew about and liked. Um, but Miller himself drew closer to the Northern California so-called Cobra group, that is, Ruscha and Keinholz. Uh, his best known work, The Waters Reglitterized, and his line art, this is Henry Miller's work, um, would seem to be compatible with Bukowski's interests and the kind of art that he was developing, but uh, just no, no influence to be discerned here, nor of Diebenkorn except that most of these Northern California and even Southern California artists were also influenced by Matisse. Now, Matisse rose to prominence as a colorist and fauve. He was introduced to the work of Van Gogh at 26, and he said that pure colors have in themselves, independently of the objects they serve to express, a significant action on the feelings of those who look at them. The use of expressive color is felt to be one of the basic elements of the modern mentality, a historic necessity beyond choice. He became renowned for his use of line. Matisse developed an aesthetic of line based on heavy, dark lines that defined mass and subject simply with a minimum in number of lines. Some of his line drawings of heads involve no more than six or seven lines continuously flowing. Never lifting the pen became a challenge, but not the law. The large head of Katya, the Grand Tête de Katya, done about 1950, is one of the best known of these line drawings. Uh, we see two specimens of Matisse's line art here. I've been 40 years in discovering that the queen of all cover, colors is black, said Matisse about this point. <clears throat> Line art minus impulse. There you have Matisse. The heavy dark line, unlike crosshatching or shading, defines. It is unambiguous. It makes simplicity a virtue, a yes or no. A space is defined and as simply as possible. But even as the line does this, it calls attention to itself because its course, its swerving, its thickness are all suggestive of an aesthetic. So the aesthetic of the line is not either or, but rather in its flow, its beginning and end, and the flow's course. The bold line invites the eye to retrace its flow, not just on each viewing, but repeatedly in a single viewing. In so doing, the bold line achieves the paradox of being a simple and seemingly definitive technique that is endlessly dynamic, and in this, it suggests the lyric. Unlike 
Matisse, Bukowski repeats subjects such as, we see here, the smoke, the bottle, the plant, or maybe just a leaf, and the animalitos, probably cats, which, as he grew older, Bukowski increasingly loved. Quote, when I'm feeling low at all, all I have to do is watch my cats, and my courage returns. These signal a familiar scene. The subject is seated or prone, and he is frequently connected by a line to furniture or to the floor. The twigs and small birds, not to mention cigarettes, give an implied narrative background to create a familiar universe for his viewer. Once you have seen the leaves, the smoke, the bottles, you know you are in Bukowski land. Bukowski often uses narrative suggestion in his drawings. Frequently, he places his subject at the left side of the drawing facing right. The subject, indicated by a large nose, a large ear, or two, and a domed head, is always the same and implied to be Buk himself. He frequently has, if not an actual cigarette, then a line or smoke trailing up suggesting one. And also frequently present is a U or square-shaped object suggesting a beer can. These two visual abbreviations create the Charles Bukowski character. The quixotic or lyric character that I just mentioned in the Matisse line is now ready for narrative suggestion. Sometimes it exists unto itself with a dilemma or comment beneath evoking the situation. Other times there is a character, another character, and the narrative becomes more complex. As here on the right, we see all the assholes in the world and mine. Uh, this is about having a colonoscopy. <clears throat> the unity of the scene here, a larger narrative is implied and is compositionally insisted upon. There are overhead lights and below the table, feet, one pair female, that balance the masked doctors and the prone Bukowski. So this is uh, more formalized than it might appear to be. It's not as casual. Right or Wrong in 18 Seconds also has these three bands. This is the racing photo on the uh, left behind me. With the bird and the sun creating an upper bound and uh, a whole series of spectators creating a lower band. Differently from other works, the action goes from right to left, which is not, in fact, how racetracks are set up in the United States. On the right, like to watch television with a girl is also stacked or boundaried compositionally at the top by the curved in headboard of a bed or backboard of a sofa, while the caption creates a bottom boundary. The bottle and the critters are balanced left and right. Another kind of Bukowski drawing is more sexual and usually unboundaried. So uh, when he chooses a subject, he also is choosing a compositional frame frequently. Uh, the female interest is usually more detailed than the male subject, and almost in every drawing of this genre, the woman is on the left. If she is on the right, the scene is more domestic. Uh, Cecile showed you uh, the Van Gogh drawing of a dog, which was uh, wonderful for me, suggesting a relation between Bukowski and animals. And uh, now I give you another aspect of his attraction to uh, Van Gogh. <laughs> this has kind of a funny story to it. Whoop. Let's go. Okay, so here's the poem that's called Working Out. And when I did a little research on this, I ran into AI. What's the, I ask my computer, uh, analysis of Bukowski's poem, Working Out? And uh, some AI engine wrote back to me, the subject has, feels himself or herself out of shape increasingly and is looking for some kind of course um, in which to get back in shape, possibly yoga or Pilates, uh, blah, blah, blah. Nothing about the actual poem, which is about Van Gogh. Van Gogh cut off his ear, gave it to a prostitute who flung it away in extreme disgust. 
Van whores don't want ears, they want money. I guess that's why you were such a great painter. You didn't understand much else. Well, not a great poem, but it indicates that Bukowski knew about Van Gogh. Probably his most famous paintings, such as his room here at Arles. Van Gogh's residue in Bukowski's life is mostly color. A dedicated user of the website BukowskiNet, not you, but one of the people there, claims that, quote, he often used colors to describe his subjects in his writings. And here is what I discovered when I did a search of 37 of his books. Don't try and keep up with the numbers. He used red 6,396 times, blue 816, yellow 460 times, white 1,088 times, black 1,050 times, pink 202 times, orange 218 times, purple 162 times, brown 274 times, and green 662 times. Wow. Other times, Bukowski, of course, declared that yellow was his favorite color. Uh, but back to the ear referenced in the poem. The biographical appeal of Van Gogh uh, to Bukowski is at least as strong uh, as an artist as, in, as the details of shabby living and prostitutes. Van Gogh also used strong lines. Here are the famous trees at Arles. Uh, repeated details and color masses in a signature way that resembles Bukowski's use in his color work. Bukowski's use of details also recalls Van Gogh's heavy paint-laden impasto strokes. There's the famous Van Gogh missing an ear. <clears throat> but in Bukowski, we also notice that line art combines with almost pure colors. Uh, this is also an example of heavily impostoed uh, strokes on the right here, the fields, probably, well, I don't know, someplace in France. In Bukowski, huh? In Provence. In Provence, okay. Sur uh, uh, point de Arles, okay. Um, in Bukowski, we also notice the line art here, the strong lines, the minimum number of them required to articulate the subject, uh, combined with almost pure colors. So in a sense, there's something from Matisse and something from Van Gogh combined here. Uh, this is very general, uh, but it's, it's a, a, theor, a clear thematic connection, especially to Van Gogh. But there's another, um, and you have a couple examples of this here, and I need to get up to another area of European painting. And this is uh, very general, but worth talking about, what we might call the milieu or topo of the washerwoman, best shown through the work of Degas. Degas sketched and painted the washerwomen of the Paris area. The use in European painting of poor working women as sexual metaphors is quite old, predating Degas in his circle. This dark Degas is a monotype reworked with a black crayon. In other words, somebody has gone over it almost in a Matisse mode and tried to emphasize the lines that the eye should follow. We notice a couple of things. Uh, Degas only produced two copies of this, thinking it wasn't saleable. We notice a couple of things here. The subjects are split left and right, but engaged in dynamic actions that tend off the page, not toward the center. Reminiscent of Bukowski. They are also bent over, and two strong verticals split the work almost into panels. Again, somewhat like Bukowski. In two studies for the uh, 1884 painting Les Repasseuses, we see even more of this uh, hunched over forms and a sexual division of labor. In addition to the bottle and the yawn, uh, underlining the fatiguing work, Degas left sections, here, here we are, uh, so that was a, a sketch for this. 
And uh, the line in the middle is not des gaz, it's because I had trouble joining these up. In Les Repassus, uh, we see uh, the, the bottle, uh, the fatiguing work, and most interestingly, he left the uh, sections above the woman's elbow and also uh, down lower unpainted to suggest a kind of uh, naked reality, raw canvas peeking through. But actually, let's not dump it all on Degas. Degas stepped into an already known topos with the washerwomen and sexuality. Paul Gavarni, one of Degas' favorite graphic artists, had painted this theme more pointedly in the 1870s. And in Degas' own era, there was Theophile Steinlin, whose 1867 cover for a musical review advanced the theme of the washerwomen and their availability. But the main, pointing, main point uh, that Bukowski makes of European color painting is self-portraiture, reminding us of the Van Gogh connection. Color is the medium of anguish, self-doubt, for Bukowski, but almost never of sexuality or of humor. That goes in the line art. Occasionally, Bukowski added color to his preferred medium of line art, but to emphasize an affective experience that he couldn't quite express, express as effectively in line art alone. Here, he crowds the canvas and uh, actually diminishes the narrative efficiency of the drawing, showing his basic instinct to keep the two uh, domains separate to be wise. The subject always is still his personal anguish. Thank you. Bon, merci. Yeah.